uh, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, this is, this is uh, we're gonna be starting to talk about androgen deprivation therapy. And I'm going to assume that each one of you is sitting in my clinic. Well, the men with prostate cancer. And um, we're, this is sort of the way I describe androgen deprivation therapy. I get that some of this is gonna be very basic for some of you, but you're gonna hear more and more about it throughout the, throughout the day and what, what, is, what are hormones, how do they work, how do we address them, and so that's, that's the intent of this talk. So, prostate cancer cells, uh, wherever they are, uh, are all behave the same well, the way. So when someone talks about prostate cancer, I'm not talking just about the, the cancer in your prostate gland, but wherever there are cells in your body, whether I can see them or not, whether they're visible on a PSMA PET or any scan, I've put, the, this is what these cells are. These prostate cancers depend on the male hormone testosterone to survive and grow. There is no cancer that is more dependent on a growth factor than prostate cancer is dependent on testosterone. So hugely important factor that leads to the growth of this cancer. <coughs> the main source of testosterone is in the testicles. So the testes produce testosterone, which drives this prostate cancer. The testicles, in turn, are stimulated by a sequence of hormones, which are secreted by the hypothalamus and pituitary glands, which are at the base of your brain. And the names of the hormones are in pink, they don't really matter. But there's this cascade of events that leads to the stimulation and growth of the prostate cancer. In the 1940s and 50s, uh, and you'll see this picture of Dr. Huggins, it's been popularized broadly, uh, who is, Dr. Huggins is a urologist at the University of Chicago, uh, who discovered that getting rid of testosterone, he did it by surgically removing the testicles, a orchiectomy, led to significant regression of the prostate cancer. And I want the audience to appreciate my high level graphics going from a big prostate cancer to a little prostate cancer. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, this sentinel observation actually earned Dr. Huggins the 1966 Nobel Prize in Medicine. And it's still in many ways, uh, the principles of this is what we do. So getting rid of testosterone, uh, kills prostate cancer cells, improves bone scans, improves CAT scans, reduces pain, prolongs life. In the era of PSA testing, which Dr. Huggins didn't have, it drops PSA dramatically. Today, as an alternative to an orchiectomy, there are injectable medicines that block the signal between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and which work just as well as orchiectomy, and I've listed them in red here, there's others. Um, these medicines work as well as orchiectomy. They have the same side effect profile. Okay. So the end result is low testosterone, and we'll be talking a little bit later about the side effects associated with low testosterone. Um, it doesn't matter how you get there. The side effects are the same. One is a surgical procedure, one is a medical procedure, but they are interchangeable. There's a scuttlebutt that somehow, you know, orchiectomy is better or worse, they're the same. Okay. That said, if we measure the testosterone that is inside the prostate cancer cells, whether we use a shot, whether we use an orchiectomy, uh, it's not normal, it's not zero, sorry. You don't completely eliminate the testosterone. And the testosterone that's left inside within the prostate cancer itself can be as high as 10 to 20% of normal. And the concern, of course, is that that can contribute to prostate cancer growth. And so a very good question is, well, gee, you've gotten rid of the testicles or you're using Lupron. Um, I should mention the names, Lupron, Zolodex, Firmagon, amongst the, the drugs that are used. Where is it coming from then, if you've gotten rid of it? And the answer is, is that there is an alternate source of testosterone. Do you guys like that? Let me do that again. <laughs> um, for those of you who know Michael Sahakian, that's his work. Um, th this is because the adrenal glands, which normally are involved in mineral, sugar, and blood pressure regulation, so they control those elements, they also have a moonlighting job. And their moonlighting job is to make a small amount of testosterone which can directly stimulate the prostate cancer. 
Once that was understood, it led to the development of a whole class of drugs which puts a block right here that prevents uh, the uptake of testosterone. So these drugs are called the anti-androgens and they can block the uptake of testosterone into prostate cancer cells wherever it's coming from, whether it's coming from the testicles or the adrenals. And there's three first generations, flutamide, nalutamide, bicalutamide, they sound alike because they are alike, and three second generations, enzalutamide, apalutamide, and daralutamide. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. But those are the names that you'll hear out there. In general, I think it's fair to say that antiandrogens add some benefit to medicines like Lupron, but are not as effective as used when used by themselves. So in general, it's been a combination of using Lupron plus one of these, and we'll talk about the circumstances. So what are the benefits of androgen deprivation therapy? Now that you know how it works. Certainly, and you'll hear about this throughout the morning in our sessions, it synergizes with radiation to improve outcomes in some patients that receive radiation. Certainly, the higher risk your cancer, the more benefit comes uh, from using the hormones. This is, you know, sentinel work done by Dr. Roach, uh, amongst others, um, and you'll be hearing from him later today. Androgen deprivation therapy certainly prolongs the time to metastases in some men with a climbing PSA after local therapy, although it's not been shown necessarily to prolong survival. Those studies really haven't been done. There's no question that androgen deprivation therapy reduces pain, improves quality of life in men with symptomatic metastatic disease, and it prolongs life in men with metastatic disease. So good question is, well, why don't we just put it in the drinking water? If it's so good. <laughs> oh, did we forget to tell you that it's in the coffee? No. <laughs> and, and the reason is that it's not trivial. And you'll, we will be talking about this later today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it now. There will be a whole session on it. But there are a lot of consequences of androgen deprivation therapy. And I suspect most of you in the room are familiar with it. I, I do want to point out that in addition to what is immediately apparent to the patient in terms of symptomatic side effects, there's also a whole host of silent events that are of great concern to us as physicians and should be to you, and we'll be talking about all of these. Um, and you can read them. I won't read them for you, for you here. The other thing that is really important is that if you're on androgen deprivation therapy long enough, and you don't first get taken out by the great earthquake or whatever, uh, androgen deprivation therapy resistance is guaranteed. So let me say that again. Androgen deprivation therapy resistance is universal. So these cells are really smart, and they figure out how to grow despite this androgen deprivation therapy, and that's the basis of a lot of our subsequent therapies. I'm going to show you how it impacts the therapies that we do. So the really important issues for us with androgen deprivation therapy is how do we reduce the side effects and avoid the resistance that we would term treatment de-intensification, do less therapy. But how do we maximize the benefits? So really hit the cancer hard, and that is treatment intensification. And those are potentially at odds with each other. And I'm going to walk you through how we think of how resistance develops and how that impacts the kinds of therapies that we would offer as it pertains to hormonal therapy. With regards to reducing side effects, the side effects that come from these therapies are not due to the therapy itself. It's not Lupron, it's not Casadex that's causing the side effect. What's causing the side effect is the low testosterone level. And it doesn't matter how you get there, it's the same side effect. So reducing the dose simply leads to less testosterone suppression and therefore less effective therapy. So reducing the dose per se doesn't really help because then you're not lowering the testosterone as much. Therefore, the best way to reduce the side effects is to shorten the duration of the therapy. So I'd like, I'm going to walk you through this relatively quickly. Uh, there's really two types of resistance to hormones. And this is, again, if you're on hormones long term, you will get one of these. So the first is called acquired or adaptive resistance. So on the uh, far left is a cancer comprised of lots of individual cells. After, do I have a pointer here? 
So pointing out, great. So after androgen deprivation therapy, you kill off a lot of the cells, so there's fewer of them. If you keep using androgen deprivation therapy, one of those cells is gonna get smart, the black cell, and is gonna learn how to live despite low testosterone. It is resistant. And you can continue to give ADT, but now what's gonna happen is those cells are gonna grow, because they don't care. And so suddenly you have this cancer that is overpopulated with these dark cells, these green or black cells that are resistant to hormones. And so go doing more hormones, conventional hormones in that setting doesn't matter. If you think of androgen deprivation therapy as treatment one, treatment two, which you'll be hearing about later from a number of us, uh, is are therapies that work once resistance works, uh, once resistance develops, and it kills off a lot of those dark cells. Some of those therapies could be a drug like Provenge or other hormonal manipulations, we'll talk about them. So this principle of therapy one leading to the need for therapy two holds true, and as we've discovered, as we've looked at these cancers, it happens with treatment two to treatment three and treatment three to treatment four. We're staying one step ahead of the cancer. The second type of resistance is quite different. This is not one where the cancer um, learns about it, but it's from day one already resistant, and we would term that innate resistance. So mutations that Dr. Feng talked about that confer resistance to ADT occur randomly and are present in some cells from day one, from the beginning. And under those circumstances, so these cells are right here, they're already present from day one before you even give androgen deprivation therapy. Once you give androgen deprivation therapy, you can kill off a lot of the white cells, but the dark cells remain. And so if you keep using androgen deprivation therapy, you wind up in the same place requiring treatment too. I already said this, regardless of the mechanisms of resistance, so acquired versus innate, you wind up at the same place, and there's been lots of treatment twos that have been developed. We'll be hearing about a lot of them, and I wanna, I'll, I'll talk about them briefly. So the reason this is important, it's not just academic, is that it helps us conceptualize how we treat advanced prostate cancer. So if you have adaptive resistance, where these cells are adapting to this ongoing ADT here, a question that we've asked is, if ongoing ADT is responsible for the development of resistance, then is stopping the ADT a way of reducing the likelihood of developing that resistance in the first place? And so what would happen is that at this point, Instead of continuing ADT, you stop it, and over time, the cells will grow up to a certain size, and then you start it all over again. And then it'll grow, uh, it'll shrink, and then at some point you stop the ADT and it cycles. And the point is that the more you cycle here, the less likely you are gonna move down the line to resistance. This is the principle of intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. And it turns out that, um, excuse me, that ADT, uh, intermittent ADT works. So intermittent therapy, oops, I'm not addressing, here we go, uh, actually uh, is very useful. So in men who have relatively low amounts of prostate cancer, what you can see here is a Kaplan-Meier plot, as Dr. Agarwal showed you, and there's no difference in terms of overall survival in this study. The study design is not important, but what does happen is that there is definitely a delay in time in hormonal resistance. So it suggests that in this group of patients, intermittent therapy might have worked. By contrast, if we, and excuse me, let me go back to this. This was in patients who had a climbing PSA following definitive local therapy. It happened to be radiation, holds true for, for uh, prostatectomy. In this group, this was patients that had widespread metastatic disease. And when we use intermittent therapy in this, you can see the red line is below the blue line, and it really was inferior. So why might intermittent therapy work only in men that have very little cancer and not so much in men with very advanced cancer? Well, it really gets to this issue of innate or preexistent resistance. resistance. 
If you believe that that resistance develops from the mutations that Dr. Fang was talking about, many of those mutations develop every time a cancer cell divides and replicates itself, the fidelity of the DNA replicating is not 100%. An error is introduced. That was the mutation that Felix talked about. The more cells you have dividing, the more errors that are introduced. So if your cancer, if you have a mutation rate of one in a million cells, and your cancer is comprised of a million cells, you'll have one mutation. If you have a cancer that's comprised of 100 million cells, you'll have 100 mutations. So the bigger your cancer, the more likely you are to have pre-existent mutations, and the less likely that intermittent therapy is gonna work, because those mutations are already there from day one. And so that's why intermittent androgen deprivation therapy is very useful in men with climbing PSAs after uh, <coughs> definitive therapy, but is not so useful in men with much more extensive disease. In men with more extensive disease, we worry a lot more about inherent mutations that are there from the day one. And the question that we've asked in them is, given the effectiveness of treatment two, and I listed a bunch of those for you, late in the course of disease, when there are many resistant cells already present, would maybe treatment would be better if you move treatment two up earlier and use treatment one plus treatment two. And indeed, this is a principle of quote unquote co-targeting, where you target with treatment one, the ADT, plus treatment two, and kill both the white cells and the black cells at the same time. And this principle of co-targeting, in fact, has been shown to prolong life substantially. And there's been a number of drugs uh, of treatment twos that have so far been tested. It's still underway. We just heard about a third uh, uh, drug doing this uh, at, our, at the oncology meetings a week ago. So bringing in treatment two early makes a difference. And so again, here's another Kaplan-Meier curve. We'll see this later. But this is patients with newly diagnosed metastatic <coughs> prostate cancer you can, you know, the hazard ratio, the area under the curve, you can see that the yellow curve is much, much better. And so this is androgen deprivation plus abiraterone versus the standard of care androgen deprivation alone. And you can see this huge difference. And there's a difference in the median, the average, so it's 53 months versus 36 months average. But more importantly, look way out here at 66 months and you know, this curve is flattening out, and there is a long, big plateau. So this is evidence that in patients with more advanced disease, treatment intensification, when I spoke of earlier, bringing in more aggressive therapy earlier has a significant impact. So here's our treatment algorithm. I'm nearing the end here. Uh, for patients that have non-metastatic, meaning by scans, you can't, conventional scans, you can't see it. Uh, you know, Peter is absolutely right that the field has completely been transformed by PSMA imaging, and we'll be hearing about that later. Um, but non-metastatic disease by conventional imaging, our recommendation is to use intermittent androgen deprivation therapy because it's a nice, it balances reducing side effects and reduce, and on the other hand, delaying the time to resistance. By contrast, if it is metastatic disease, then we typically would use uh, intensification with ADT with one of these drugs, and if it's really metastatic, then we add in a chemotherapeutic drug like docetaxel. So I hope I've been able to show you how this theoretical framework turns into, it's actually been studied in our labs, turns into therapeutic decision making. And so when your doctor is thinking about these treatments, that's what's going through their mind. I would encourage you when you speak to your physician to say, well, why is intermittent antigen deprivation therapy appropriate for me here? You know, am I the right person for it? Um, and with that, thank you very much. We're, we're running about 10 or 15 minutes late, so I'll take a couple of questions, and then we'll all be around during the breaks as well. Please fill out your forms. Look, look at the, on your forms, look at the, I don't even know the scale, but at the end where it says, the best speaker of the day, check that one. <laughs> Thank you.
One, one question that's been asked, why not try to stimulate the body's DNA repair cells to deal with the mutations? Great question. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that later. Um, thus far, um, that hasn't been feasible in humans. Developing CRISPR technology lets you cut out mutations. Who knows what the future holds? But it does allow us, and you'll hear later from Rahul, uh, to take advantage of if the body is not repairing its mutations well, we can sort of push those cells over the edge and kill them off. Ah, what lab diagnostics can identify when it's time for an individual patient to stop ADT for, for intermittent therapy, define the interval period? Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it turns out that it's very simple. It's just driven by PSA. So as the PSA climbs to a certain level, you can, you can uh, make decisions on that. There is, despite all the work we've done with Felix and others, there is no simple genetic test to tell you when the cancer is, is developing that resistance. Our definition is clinical. And the clinical definition of resistance to hormone therapy is your PSA is going up despite a low testosterone. That's the definition and that's what we use. Um, the interval period that someone asked about that is based on, uh, is driven by PSA. It's a year on hormones and then the period off typically is a year or so driven by PSA. Um, let's see. So um, if, if testosterone aggravates prostate cancer, why don't young men have a lot of prostate cancer? <laughs> and if the level of testosterone is so important to prostate cancer, why doctors uh, don't recommend the frequent measurement of testosterone? Okay, so uh, the role of testosterone in developing prostate cancer is quite different than the role of testosterone in stimulating cancer once you have it. So once you have it, there's no question that testosterone will make that prostate cancer grow. There are situations where testosterone supplementation can be used in men who have well-controlled prostate cancer that is low grade, low risk, so forth, has had definitive therapy. Um, so, but in general, if your prostate cancer is present, then testosterone is, is not a good thing other than the side effects, right? And so you have to figure out uh, how to address that. Um, okay. Um, now this is a question for Felix. What is the source of intelligence in a cancer cell that makes it so damn smart? <laughs> Um, it's a great question. You know, it, I, I mean, I use, I stay, I made the comment that's a smart cell. They're not smart, but they are incredibly adaptive. And the process by which these cells adapt to the stresses that we subject them to is a subject of our research. There's incredible plasticity and pliability of cancer cells. It's one of the things that makes cancer cancer and a step that we have to stay uh, ahead of to get them.